and here, and then let me do this real quick for everybody. We're down here. Okay, well, thank you everyone for um, attending this wonderful conference. Uh, this is my third time back, so I want to thank Stephen and everybody here at The Real Truth About Health for putting this event on. It's a, it's a great honor. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in my place of normalcy right now, so <laughs> forgive me. I'm a little, I'm traveling and I'm, I'm in the middle of everything else going on. So um, I'll do my best to, to provide you a, a wonderful lecture today. Um, what I'm going to show you today is going to be a part, uh, it's a sub-segment a sub of my book. Uh, as you all know, I wrote a, a book called An Inflammation Nation, and if you haven't read it, please do. Um, but what I also want to do today is kind of take one little bit of part of it and then go into a little bit more detail. Um, for those who you haven't heard about the book or you haven't read it, you can go back to last year's lecture, the year before I covered actually the 10 steps, the definitive steps, what I call to preventing, reversing, and treating all diseases with diet diet, lifestyle, and natural inflammatories. But today I want to talk about microbiome because it is a subsection of my book and wanted to kind of give just more of a, a general summary. What, what is the microbiome, how to tune it up, how to repair it, and how to restore it. And um, although the details in my book today, I'm going to cover a broad stroke of just understanding what the microbiome is. So let's get started. So what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is what I consider the first line of defense of your body. You know, it begins with, um, it's the first part of digestion, absorption, uh, exc excretion, and it starts from the mouth. A lot of people kind of tend to forget the mouth, but it starts with the mouth, goes to the stomach, small intestines, and colon. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a lot of pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. And understanding your own physiology, I mean, unfortunately, most most people don't have, uh, you know, anatomy classes or, or, or human body classes or even home ec. Uh, in school anymore. And so we kind of tend to just go to the doctor and we have a problem, we see a commercial and we take a pill or we even take a supplement, but not understanding just your own normal anatomy can be um, uh, a disadvantage because once you understand how things are working, then you can kind of work through why are the recommendations or what we should be doing to help restore and be participating in your health recovery and help optimization. So it's, it's where 80% of your immune system resides. So a lot of people think, well, where's my immune system? Well, most of it's in your gut. And we'll talk about that today. And more importantly, over the last five years, where a lot of research is coming and exploding in the microbiome sphere is looking at neurotransmitters and how the gut brain axis and how your gut controls your mood. And I'll explain that as well. So let's get started here. Now, we all have heard of this term probiotics. Right, everybody talks about probiotics. You see commercials on television all the time, but I want to just get into a little bit more specifics about probiotics because there's just a misunderstanding. A lot of people think, you know, for example, when you go to the store, you see a commercial, okay, there's a product that says like, oh, my GI doctor tells me to take something called a line. It's a probiotic species. Well, that's fine, but guess what? It's only 1 billion of one species and we have over a thousand species. In fact, it might be much, much more than that by the time I finish this lecture, because every day they're discovering more and more new species uh, of probiotics. Now, the interesting thing is the total probiotic population is over 100 trillion CFUs. Now, when you get a probiotic, you'll see like the little units on the back of the package, or it tells you how many you know, billions or millions you're getting. Those are what they call CFUs. That's the units. But we have 100 trillion in our gut. And the interesting thing is when you go buy a supplement, you know, like I was mentioned the one before, just the GI doctors might recommend or something you get over the counter, it has one species of only a hunt of one billion. And we're talking about a hundred trillion. Okay, so it's just worlds away. So is it does it mean that probiotics are bad? No. But what it tells us is that there's a lot of discrepancy in what the market is delivering. We need to get potency, we got to get purity, we got safety and efficacy. That's kind of our mantra at Sangevity. And what we've been looking at is that now we have to start looking at dosing at higher doses, particularly when people actually have true dysfunctions. So we're starting about 100 billion or more. And now when you look at the clinical research with pharmaceutical probiotics that are giving out, they're talking about almost giving, you know, 800, 900 billion in a serving many, many, many more times than the average person will get anything over the counter. And more importantly, just to kind of put that in, in, in a summary of how much probiotic is in our gut. 
it's about four pounds on average, three to four pounds, the total weight. So when we talk about our gut, and I'll tell you how long your gut is. And if you were to sprinkle these little things all inside your GI tract, it's a lot of probiotics. So a lot of people think it's kind of like homeopathically, just small little bits there. Four pounds, if you got a four pound bag of rice and you had to carry that around with you, you'll see that that's quite a lot of weight. So probiotics are most, uh, is, is quite important. And understanding that 90%, let me, let me show you here, you know, probiotics, most probiotics are guaranteed at the time of potency is at the time of manufacture, not at the time that you take them. So what does that mean? If someone says they're selling you 1 billion of one species, that's the time of they make it. Now, when they make it, they're also like it goes to the factory, then from the factory it goes to production, and then from the production it goes to warehousing, and the warehousing goes to distribution and shipping, and then finally gets to your store, and then you know it sits on the shelf for a while, you buy it and you take it home. That could be anywhere from three months to nine months uh, in that process time, and we now have data to show that that potency, you know, at the time they said one billion, or maybe ten billion, or maybe twenty-five billion, and it starts to decrease over time. In fact, it, it, the, there's what they call a degradation of probiotics due to the temperature due to the humidity. And so when we actually look at um, creating probiotics, and I, I've been kind of a very OCD about this for many, many years now, is that we're looking at things like acid stability, you know, making sure that the probiotics gets past the stomach acid. Again, most products in the market are not there for that. So they might even give you a right species or species. They might give you even a right dosing, but then it's not acid stable and it gets destroyed in the stomach acid. And then again, most of them are a few billion or less. So you really want to look at higher potency as of multiple species. And right now, if you went to the health store or if you went on uh, online and you bought all the probiotics that you have on the market from any brand, any company, from a large a manufacturer to a doctor's brand, for example, there's only about maybe 60, uh, 70 maximum different potencies. I mean, sorry, different uh, probiotic species out there. And remember, I talked about there's over a thousand species. So we're really behind because it's hard to, you know, manufacture, it's hard to actually test because we also want to make sure that these are the right type of bugs, the healthy bugs, not bad ones. And then also it takes a long time because of the purity of how they actually have to extract these things to make sure that they're living and are safe enough to give because there can be, you know, bad uh, probiotics as well. Right? There's, there can be pathogens as well. And also there's a lot of delay in the, the science because of who discovered it, how they scientifically have to name it. And, and there's people all over the world, scientists from very risk, a variety of countries that were now looking at, well, who discovered what first? Because now the goal is now in terms of pharmaceuticals and, and nutraceuticals is patenting and kind of trademarking these things and, and uh, um, having those aspects of like, it is our strain because they've discovered it. But what we have to understand also is that they're not only acid, not acid stable and low potency in most probiotics, but also when people try to get it in food like yogurts or kefir or kombucha, it's just really not enough. Now, are these things helpful? Sure, absolutely. From a food-based standpoint, you should be having. Now, we're going to talk about not having it from the dairy. You can have plant-based forms, right? But don't just consider like I'm eating a yogurt or my doctor says I need to take a, you know, some kind of a probiotic um, yogurt to help fix my gut. In fact, when you actually look at some of those studies on the ones that you see on television, you have to take like four to six of those and there's about $4 to $5 per, per, per yogurt. So again, the, the cost is not really there to actually have a true clinical benefit. We're going to talk about things that you can do with your diet. In addition to taking the right kind of probiotics, we always give that to our patients. And so our patients will always say, gosh, Dr. Pai, I tried your probiotics. They're so different. It's like, yeah, because we've been looking at potency, purity, safety, efficacy with all our products. In fact, our probiotics are guaranteed at that potency at the time that you take it. So we actually put in more. So we look at temperature and degradation over two years. And then ensure that at the time that someone takes a probiotic from us, that it will have exactly what it says on the bottle, in the bottle, at the time they take it. Now, probiotics have a, a wonderful role, and the role is actually helping with digestive system and immune system, uh, as well as many other things. But these are just simplifying just some major categories. And we all know that when we take antibiotics, you know, it does kill bad bacteria right? Because we need to take out an infection. So you have a sore throat, you have a pneumonia, you have a urinary tract infection. Great. We give antibiotics. And thankfully we have that, you know, outside of sanitation, antibiotics is the thing that's kept our, our population of humans uh, alive on this planet more than anything else. But the problem is it also kills the good bacteria. It's non, it's non uh, specific. So it kills good and it kills bad. Just like in war, there's never a, what they call a smart bomb. We're trying to get more targeted aspects, but there's always going to be some kind of collateral damage. Now, what most people don't know, and this is what I want to get across today, and that's why I kind of went into this idea of talking about um, 
microbiome is that natural antibiotics do the same. You know, this is a common misunderstanding that almost most of my patients who come see me from all over the world uh, when we do Zoom consultations is that they will be taking natural antibiotics chronically. So they'll say, you know, uh, Dr. Pai, I had a history of yeast infections and I uh, was told to take oregano oil. I did research or I'm taking a product and it helped really well. Um, and they go, how long have you been taking? And they'll say, well, I've been taking it for like six months. And they go, how are you feeling? Well, I feel like I'm, I'm getting worse. And the reason being is because natural antibiotics, meaning coming from plants, also do the same thing. They kill bad bacteria correctly, but they also kill good bacteria. They're not discriminating between just because it's natural that it's only getting the bad guys. And that's a quite a, a common misunderstanding. So people buy things at the health food store or from uh, natural healthcare practitioners and sometimes continuously take something. Well, I'm taking this candida cleanser, this parasite cleanser, some kind of you know anti antibiotic, or or more importantly, we've seen in the last couple of years, you know, with with the essential oil revolution uh, that we see this misunderstanding of uses of medicines kind of now given to the public where people willy nilly will just take, you know, I take oregano every day for prevention, but that's like taking amoxicillin every day for prevention. You wouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. These things should be given in certain potencies for a certain period of time. Otherwise, you're causing more harm than good. Now, we do know interesting thing with, with the last couple of years is that one dose of antibiotics you know, just one pill of a simple amoxicillin, which we do need to use, by the way, in certain types of infections uh, or any kind of antibiotic, can cause GI dysfunction up to 18 months later. So it's not always at the time, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm, I have, I, I take an antibiotic, I get diarrhea, or I'll have to take probiotics to prevent me from getting diarrhea. But that, that GI dysfunction may not happen in the seven or 10 days that someone's taken antibiotic. In fact, it actually can happen almost up to two years later. So most people will then never remember that, oh yeah, I had an ear infection or a respiratory infection, say in the winter time, and now it's coming here spring and forgetting that, oh my God, that could be causing some of my symptoms or my higher risk of having these kinds of symptoms. As well as we also see is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is actually even more damaging to the microbiome. Now, we need to give chemotherapy in many instances uh, for cancer. Um, the question is, why do people have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, mouth ulcers in the use of chemotherapy? Say, for example, someone has breast cancer, someone has a brain tumor, someone has skin cancer or colon cancer. You know, a lot of people say, well, gosh, I understand if I have colon cancer and I'm taking chemo to kill something in my gut that I should have symptoms, maybe some nausea or vomiting or something like that. But um, we're looking at, well, what about, um, what about um, those kind of uh, aspects? Hold on a second. Uh, those kind of aspects of looking at when someone gets chemotherapy, why, is they ha why are they having um, side effects when it's not in the area of where the chemo is? So for example, someone has a brain tumor, why are they having nausea and vomiting? Why are they have, you know, someone's had breast cancer, why are they having nausea and vomiting and diarrhea? It's because the chemotherapies kill cancer cells and cancer cells are rapidly dividing cells, right? Because they're just growing out of control. Um, but what happens is the, the first fastest turnover cell in your body is actually your GI tract. The, the, from the cells in your mouth, all the way down the esophagus, all the way down to your stomach, small intestine, colon, rectal area, those cells every three days are shedding. Okay. So it's the fastest turnover cell. You know, like your red blood cells last three months, your skin, you know, is always constantly, you know, uh, exfoliating, your hair is always growing, your bones is a one year structure, for example, it takes a one year to have a complete new skeleton of the, you know, each bone cells, you know, adding a bone cell and removing an old bone cell, but your, your, your GI tract from mouth to bottom is a three day cycle. So what happens is chemotherapy correctly kills a cancer cell. But indiscriminately, unfortunately, then it also gets confused and says, hey, you know what? This cell is also rapidly dividing and it hits the GI tract. Okay. So that's, I always want to explain that because a lot of patients get confused. They're like, gosh, you know, my tumor's over here. I understand it if I was having problems over here that I should have GI issues. But why am I getting GI issues regardless of what type of chemotherapy I'm choosing or any kind of chemotherapy? Because, you know, there's newer ones and immunotherapies and old ones and low dose ones and high dose ones and cocktails, but that concept is that it's hitting these cells indiscriminately. And that's what we have to start looking at. Now, what we need is that we do need to use antibiotics in certain cases. We do need to use chemotherapies in many cases, and we need to use natural antimicrobials when we have the option, but there is a collateral damage done. And so we need to understand how do we restore that function? And once you understand how to restore that function, this needs to be addressed by the way, then you can actually bring back that person back to optimum health. Now, starting with the mouth, as we all know that the mouth is, you know, the beginning of digestion, right? And we actually have enzymes in the mouth that are starting to, to, to break down our food. But more importantly now, 
where we're kind of off with medicine, and, and I think there's a couple of speakers uh, that are dentists in the, in in this this year's uh, program. But we ended when uh, what happens is in my in my opinion is that you know dentists are the doctors of the mouth, and doctors are the doctors of everything else, and there's a lack of communication between these two parties. And in fact, we should be talking together because now we understand that most of these diseases now are looking at different type of overgrowths and undergrowths of certain types of bacteria in the mouth. Dental health is super, super important. Now, doctors don't usually talk about it because that's the dentist's job. But we have to encourage our patients, even though we're not dentists, to actually have and go see uh, their dental care, make sure that they are going to the dental uh, visits regularly, and more importantly, making sure that they don't have periodontitis, inflammation in the, in the gums or infections, uh, chronic infections, or even people have risk of then getting more like root canals and things like that. But now we understand like Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, just fibrosis, certain types of cancer like esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, and you know more importantly, inflammatory conditions of the joint and risk of diabetes and pancreatic cancer are all now just, these are bacteria that we're now seeing that are evolving from bad dental health. And so what we have to be careful of is just kind of over sterilizing the mouth, right? So a lot of people grew up like, oh, I'm supposed to take some kind of Listerine like product or scope like product. And, you know, here's some kind of antiseptic mouthwash and they, you know, gargle to make their fresh breath. Not understanding that that's just like the antibiotics. We're wiping out the bad stuff, but we're also wiping out the good stuff. Good dental care is just going to be brushing your teeth, flossing your teeth, making sure you're getting, you know, um, uh, good regular dental checkups. And there's even natural toothpaste that actually can improve periodontal disease. I just had a client the other day. They had multiple pockets, about seven on, on millimeters on their gum line. And uh, they were told that if they didn't get it fixed, they would have to have surgery. We told them to get some good dental care. We have some natural uh, mouth cleansers that use natural antimicrobials that are not going to sterilize the mouth, but clean the mouth. You know, they do the flossing. And and they use the toothpaste and, and then their pockets of seven went down to twos and threes, which are normal. And, and, the, and the, the, the dental assistant told the patient that they've never seen this in all 20 years of their practice. Um, so there's, there is things that we can do to help regenerate those types of tissues. But understanding that the microbiome is starting from the mouth because everybody thinks like gut, gut, gut. And remember, the gut starts in the mouth as well. So good dental hygiene is super, super important. Again, as doctors, we don't talk about it because that's not our specialty, but we should start leaning a little bit into that realm and saying, hey, you know, let's find out, let's ask our you know, ask your patients now, if there's physicians or other uh, people on the panel, we should be asking our patients about their dental health because a lot of times we think someone else is doing it. And the key is that we should also be following that uh, indirectly because we can also assist with some of these other issues that dentists won't be able to treat. So it's, it's nice to have a collaborative care team with each of our patients. Now, looking at the mouth, then he goes down this tube called the esophagus. Okay, so the esophagus is like the food chute. Food comes down and goes right here into the stomach. This is your stomach, and it's got the muscle layers around it, and this is what the inside of your stomach will look like. It's like kind of a red pouch, and I, I consider the stomach to be the Vitamixer. It's kind of this, you know, expensive blender that everybody wants to get in the restaurant industry. You know, it makes, you know, blends anything into a smoothie kind of thing. Um, and so, or any of those fancy blenders, by the way. And so it's kind of like this, things come in and it blends it very well. Now, what's inside the stomach is acid. Now, the stomach produces acid and we need acid. The misunderstanding with, with right now with conventional GI is that it, a lot of people think that there's an acid problem. I'm getting, you know, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? We get a little bit of acid coming up here. Now, this tube here is not, is not designed to have acid. This is like a chute, okay? So the, the cells that line this are, are, very, are very soft and very fragile. The cells that are in here have this nice thick mucus lining. You can see in this picture, I'll show you in another picture on the next slide but it can handle the acid. In fact, there's a nice mucus layer. So our body produces acid to digest all your proteins, carbohydrates, fats, uh, vitamins, minerals, you know, things like that. But what happens is um, when there's inflammation here due to diet, due to lifestyle, uh, more importantly, when there's inflammation due to antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, stress, alcohol, we'll cover these things today, but that that causes a dysfunction here to this lining. Then once we have this, this nice, let me get to the next picture to show you here. Once we have this nice glistening protective line, lining of mucus here, the acid is kind of like swashing around here. It's kind of like a washing machine. It's just kind of tumbling everything and kind of cleaning up everything. And in this case, it's grinding everything. 
But when there's inflammation here or irritation due to chemicals and stress and alcohol and a lot of other things like non steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen commonly, uh, naproxen and those kind of things, they will cause a dysfunction here where it kind of ruins this lining. It gets inflamed. So we get a gastritis. Remember, inflammation, I-T-I-S. So the suffix, anything that goes you know, at the end of the word, it says inflammation of. So arthritis is inflammation of your joints. Gastritis is inflammation of your stomach. Esophagitis is inflammation of your esophagus. Colitis is inflammation of your colon, et cetera, et cetera. You can listen to my previous lectures and I'll go through all the details of what inflammation is. And I'll be speaking also on Thursday uh, about the stacking effects of inflammation. I'm going to go into that very, very specifically. So you'll learn a lot new different things than I spoke in the last two years. But going back to this, when we look at this uh, GI tract, it, once it gets irritated and, and disruptive, then our own acid, which is natural, which is what we need, it actually irritates itself. And when it irritates itself, then we get more inflammation. We get pain, we get heartburn, we get reflux. Now, when people go back to having this reflux, usually it's due to a couple of things. We're usually overeating. In general, it's usually eating overeating standard American diet, pro-inflammatory foods, plus alcohol, tobacco, and you know, a whole bunch of other things. But we eat a large meal at the end of the day, and we go home and we sleep almost pretty much after we eat. And then laying flat, then instead of this little sphincter closing up, the food, when it's blending here, it kind of goes upwards. And that's why people end up having heartburn at night. That's why they always tell people, why don't you raise your bed a little bit? And that will help kind of with gravity, keep this from going up, which is a wonderful thing. But more importantly, we want to look at what are those foods that are coming in and that I'll be talking on Thursday about pro-inflammatory foods. I'll talk a little bit about today as well. And we have to look at like, well, what are we eating? Are we eating too much? And there's other issues where this we, people can get like a hiatal hernia here, which is just an outpouching as well. Hiatal hernias, uh, interesting enough, are related to a higher correlation of people who have chronic constipation. Because when we're trying to evacuate the bowels chronically for decades, when people have this, you know, chronic constipation issues, then actually the force of the of this whole GI tract goes above this diet. There's a diaphragm over here and it pouches out here. So actually people who have chronic constipation patient have a higher rate when they have endoscopies, the scoping from above of having hiatal hernias. So again, one way to help lower the esophageal sphincter uh, issue and having the hiatal hernia is making sure that people are not constipated and eating more uh, fiber in their diet, which I'll talk about. Now, even in the stomach here, there is with an electron microscope, that's a super microscope now. Again, so this is looking at just generally if we put a camera when we're doing endoscopy. But now when we look with a super microscope, we can actually see the little individual cells where, where the enzymes are coming out, the acid is coming out, where certain digestion actually starts to begin in the stomach. Not a lot, but a certain amount is actually occurring. But more importantly, there is a lining here that is full of probiotics. A lot of people think probiotics are just in the small intestine and colon, but actually there's probiotics in this is, is in the stomach. And also in this GI tract, there is certain types of bacteria that are good. And there's certain bacteria that are bad. One of them is called H. pylori, which many of you have, may have heard of. Many of you may have actually had H. pylori. Once we have a, 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 an ulcer due to the inflammation, due to a variety of factors, then that bacteria is hanging around here and it actually comes and it lives inside the ulcer and prevents this lining from being uh, covering the, the wound, and then our acid will continue to, to, to bother ourselves. And that, that H. pylori is a really, really stubborn bacteria. Why? Is it stubborn? Is because it is actually living in a pH of one. The stomach acid here is hydrochloric acid, pH of one to two in the average person. So it's like it's like if you ever had a pool, and you go to mix with pool chemicals, you got chemicals, you got to wear gloves. It says hydrochloric acid, and you're changing the pH of the pool. If you drop that hydrochloric acid on the cement around the pool or the pool deck, you'll see that it burns a hole right through it. Right, because that's how strong that's how strong this acid is in your stomach. So when we don't have that nice protective layer, then it's easy to cause ulcers and cause actually bleeding in the stomach. Right. More importantly, is that this bacteria H. pylori, when it comes, it's very very stubborn. Why? Because again, it's living in a pH of one. So it kind of laughs at everybody. It's like, hey, what are you going to give me? I live in the most fiery, fiery, acidic part of our body, and that's why they usually have to give like what they call a triple cocktail, two antibiotics and an acid blocker for about 14 days to knock this out. Now. Now, we actually have natural therapies that about five out of six times in the last uh, cases that we have that are very successful at knocking out H. pylori. Some people can't tolerate the antibiotics. Some people actually now have allergies to antibiotics because they've taken so many. And some people just want to avoid it, say, can I take a natural therapy? Yes, we can. But remember, the natural antimicrobials, although they're safer and more tolerable, still are knocking out good guys. So we still have to replenish even when we're doing natural therapies. Now, 
Going now further into the small intestine. So here's the stomach up here, and then we get down in here to the small intestine. The small intestine now is like a hose. Okay, so it's like everybody went to the hardware store and bought a 35 foot garden hose. And that's about the size of our GI tract, about 35 feet on the average person. So it doesn't matter how skinny you are, if you were 90 pounds or you were 400 pounds, we still have the same hose. Okay, and so that's the parts of the hardware store that we bought. And it's floppy, it's not thick. So the small intestine, I always tell people, is like spaghetti. If you stand on your head, you're doing yoga, you're rolling around playing with your kids, you know, it is, it is, it kind of flops around. Whereas, you know, the stomach is fixed and the colon over here, this, oh, let me show you the colon here colon here, it's fixed. It's got ligaments. And that's why we can put a scope and we can look and do a colonoscopy, thankfully, right? So we can do a colonoscopy. We can do an endoscopy here in the stomach going over here. But this part of the small intestine is hard to see because it's floppy. So we can't stick a, a camera. Now they do have uh, technologies, which is coming out. And it's, it's rare, but it'll be, it'll be um, more popular over time is that there's actually camera pills that people are now able to swallow they're getting smaller, thankfully, as the years go on. So I remember when it first came out, it seemed like someone was swallowing a, a, a computer mouse. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's a long thing to swallow. Uh, now they're getting smaller and smaller, like little pills. But it actually will go through this GI tract and take pictures automatically. So then they can look at it on the computer and they can see any other areas of lesions or damage or inflammation or disruption or cancers or, or bleeding in the small intestine, which we can't see now. But we do have certain tests now that actually can measure some of the dysfunction of the small intestine, and that's breath testing. And, and some of the dysfunction here that is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, more importantly, when we look at an endoscopy, now when we're looking at it here, remember, we saw the stomach, and then say that we're looking at the colon. When they look at it with a camera, it actually looks like this, right? It's like this big pink tube, okay? And what they're looking for is polyps. Polyps are like little fat grapes fatty tissue, they look like grapes. And the more polyps we have, the higher rate of those polyps turning into something um, uh, not good for us, right? Because all polyps are is a response to chronic inflammation of the colon. So when people have a, a low fiber diet, standard American diet, having a bowel movement every, you know, two, three, four days, you know, some, some patients in uh, Florida, men over 65, maybe every seven days, sometimes every 10 days now, what's happening just due to the standard American diet is that that chronic inflammation in the colon due to just not having the bowel movement creates more polyps. Polyps is just a response of inflammation and the body's kind of like extruding and kicking out um, the cells that are actually really hot and really inflamed. And so when you have a colonoscopy, thankfully what we do is they, the, the GI doctor will clip out those little polyps and actually prevents which is fantastic, by the way, prevents that little polyp from potentially turning into a cancer in the future. We can't see these things. We can't feel these things. And uh, definitely there's no blood test yet for those things. And so getting a routine colonoscopy is very, is, especially if you're high, high risk or certain age, definitely need to do that because they can actually eliminate your risk or catch things early enough. Unfortunately, with colon cancer being the number two cause of cancer in the United States, in both men and women, the number two cause of death uh, outside of heart disease, which is number one, um, we definitely need to address this GI tract issue with constipation and inflammation. Now, when we look at this, this colon tissue here, under the microscope, again, and then my book covers this a lot, and I always talk about these little finger-like projections, this intestinal villi. These are the little spaces in between. So it looks like this from a gross camera, but again, when you look with a microscope, it's gonna look like little, little fingers. This is the spaces where the food particles go in, okay? Throughout this 35-foot track. Now, when we take out this GI track and we actually iron these little finger-like projections out, the surface area of your GI tract is two tennis courts worth of space, right? So it's huge. So a lot of people are like, well, I have a 35 foot track. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe 120 pounds. Okay. And, but you still have two tennis courts worth of surface area. Remember we have a hundred trillion of four pounds of over a thousand species of different good guys, but we also have a lot of space. And that's where the absorption, assimilation, excretion of taking all your foods and nutrients is occurring. Now, when we go to the colon again, it's fixed. So they can look at it with the camera. We can look at polyps. We can look at diverticulosis, which are pouches. We can dive diverticulitis, which is inflammation of the colon, making sure there's not colon or, or rectal tumors. Okay. Um, but when we take a slight slice, this is a this is a section here of um, uh, intestine here, 
And we're looking at it, you can see there's muscle tissue. So that's what, that's what causes peristalsis, okay? Like the squeezing effect of, you know, moving the foods down. Stomach blends the food, remember, Vitamix or kind of uh, production into a smoothie. And it comes down as a smoothie through this 35 foot track. And as you can see, it's different shapes and sizes, different wrinkles. And then in each of these little wrinkles, those are those little tiny little finger-like projections. And I'll show you some pretty cool pictures here. This is what now, the, from, from an artist depiction now, when we're looking at the electron microscope and then using digital uh, imaging uh, of looking at, this is what it would look like. Little, little finger-like projections. It's pretty interesting. So even though we look at it, it looks like a pink tube. Now we're getting like the smallest of the small. So this is looking at like those little spaces of where the food particles go in. And this is another artist depiction here of like then looking at molecules of like certain proteins or carbohydrates and fats and stuff going into these little spaces. Okay. So again, it's not just like this big flat pink tube. It's actually this little tiny little finger like projection. And it's so important to understand that we have to maintain this barrier. We have to make sure that all of this is correct and making sure that we can restore this after it becomes dysfunctional. And then we got our little probiotics too. And so again, having over a thousand of these different species, they're also lining. You know, probiotics I consider like the employees of your GI tract, the GI tract corporation. And they show up to work. And uh, what they have to do is they have to assimilate these foods. They have to uh, move the foods where they need to go. They also have to look at um, keeping your immune system strong. Remember, 80% of your immune system is in the GI tract. So these are things that we have to look at in terms of probiotics. But not only that is that certain probiotics, when they're missing, we actually have certain diseases. And now we're like actually looking at in the last three years or four years, there's actually pharmaceutical studies, which are looking at specific species that are related to our neurological function, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Alzheimer's diseases, autism diseases, schizophrenic diseases are now being related to dysfunctions of the gut dysfunction and loss of certain species of probiotics. And when they have replaced them in the clinical trials, interesting thing, 70% improvement of those symptoms. Again, we're talking about gut function treatment, not anything in the brain. So where the disconnect is that neurology has been treating all these things because they're, they're doctors of the head, but we have to understand that a lot of this dysfunction of neurological issues now, which I'll show you also, is coming strongly from the gut. And that's why they don't respond to a lot of the neurological treatments, but they do respond better when the gut is healed and fixed. So interesting understanding this is key uh, going forward. Now, triggers of the microbiome dysfunction, what can cause this wonderful layer to become dysfunctional. The following. Now, this is not all of them. This is just a kind of a, a top list, okay? So, so you know, there's, there's plenty more things that can cause it, but let's talk about the big, the big guns. Alcohol and tobacco, I don't need to go into that, but that is covered in my book, okay? And now, more importantly, we got we to gotta recommend, especially the younger, uh, uh, younger generation of vaping. These also still cause problems. It's not a safer cigarette. It's just like saying something's a safer gun. There's no such thing, okay? So if there, there's going to be collateral damage and there's damage when they are fired, um, and most of the time they're fired inappropriately. So alcohol is a direct, uh, uh, actually, chemotoxin, so it actually will actually cause dysfunction. That's why people get gastritis and stomach also just from chronically drinking. Um, same thing with tobacco, with all the chemicals in the tobacco and now even with the chemicals in the vaping, that actually still causes dysfunction to microbiome. Now, these are the most common ones, acid blockers, NSAIDs, antibiotics, chemotherapy, foodborne illness, GMOs, environmental toxins, and even some of the things that, you know, again, some of the providers out maybe in this conference might be talking about, but even things that people might think that are helpful are actually more dysfunctional to the microbiome, like colonics and enemas. I will talk about the standard American diet and how animal protein and saturated fats definitely cause dysfunction and inflammation into the gut. And more importantly, we can't all forget stress because we can have a perfect diet, we can have a perfect environment, but if we're still stressed, you can still cause dysfunction to your microbiome. So we can't uh, forget that stress plays an important role uh, in, in your overall gut health. So let's talk about acid blockers. Acid blockers are common. You know, a large percent of the population now, I mean, these used to be prescription. Now they're all over the counter and people are taking these drugs for decades. What we now understand is that in the clinical research of these drugs, right, we started off with these kind of ones, the H2 blockers, and then we went to the PPI, the proton pump inhibitor, the purple pills. These things cause dysfunction to the microbiome. Why? It's because when we turn off acid, that pH change, turning it off, so, so yes, it helps with the ulcer. In fact, in the studies, you know, for up to 12 weeks, it's clinically indicated if someone had a 
GI ulcer. So if someone has H. pylori, sure, take it up to 12 weeks if you want, no problem. Um, but the interesting thing is there's no long-term data on people taking these drugs, and people take it now 30, 40 years every day over the counter. What they're treating is their symptom. So if someone has heartburn or reflux, um, and they always show these commercials on television when the food is slapping them, you know, here's your, you know, barbecue chicken wings or your pizza or your, you know, in your, in your, in your beer and all these other things are, you know, the spicy foods and in the, they always show these pictures where people are fighting their food. You should never be fighting your food. In fact, your food should be nourishing at the end of the day. And so this is a concept that we're always like trying to conquer our body. Oh, we have the symptoms. Well, let's just quiet down. Let's just slap it down, you know, or let's just, you know, punch it down or whatever. That's the wrong kind of approach to everything. We have to look at like, can we actually help look at what's coming in that's triggering this inflammatory response? So the acid blockers not only are blocking and decreasing the pH, by decreasing the pH, we are now changing the bacteria and how they grow. And so the studies will now show when people are taking acid blockers, regardless of the type, particularly these ones that are PPI, that are stronger ones, they have a higher rate of having bacterial overgrowth, dysbiosis of the GI tract, right? So they get more SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and they get more gut dysbiosis, which means just, just uh, overgrowth of the colon. So it's not, and in addition, which my book will cover in other lectures I've talked about in the past and we'll talk about in the future, is it's also, since you're turning down the acid, you're also turning down your ability to break down proteins, carbohydrates, fats, micronutrients, and micronutrients. So when we do a nutrition test on our patients who have been on these products for many years, you know, they might even be plant-based and eating perfect organic foods and growing things in their yard and, you know, not eating processed foods and they have very, very low nutrition in terms of their absorption, because this is, this is prohibiting them from getting their food as medicine. Now, more importantly, these products are, which most people take, you know, a, a third of the population takes this every day. These are the ibuprofens and the, and the, the Napersons and, you know, the Aleve-like and the Advil-like and the Motrin-like uh, products uh, for headaches, for back pain, for joint pain. Um, for those who never heard of a black box warning, you definitely want to read my book. Uh, these, all these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have a black box warning. If you don't know what a black box warning means, it just means it can put you in the black box, which is the coffin. Uh, it's the FDA warning saying that you can have this and a life-threatening illness or evident, uh, incident can occur. With the NSAIDs, it's, it's heart attack, stroke, and GI bleed can happen more commonly commonly that is, than just having ringing in the ears or swelling of the ankles or heartburn uh, or nausea. So it is something that, you know, a third of the population takes every day. And the problem is when people take this, um, there is a warning on these products, which is called a black box. And basically you've consented. If you take one of these products and you have those problems, you can't sue the manufacturer because it's on the product as, as the insert uh, warnings. And so doctors recommend it, television's recommending it, you know, everybody's advertising it. It's, it's one of the leading causes when we look at the cause of death that's outside of lifestyle. So it's not heart disease. It's not, we're not talking about cancer now. Those are lifestyle and, and environmental issues, right? But we're just talking about like diseases from things that we give, side effects of drugs, the number one class of killing, uh, you know, a large percentage of the million people that die from side effects of drugs per year, that all that research is in my book, by the way, is... Um, coming from this class. So we will talk about the use of natural anti-inflammatories on my lecture on Thursday and looking at what we can do to use as, as something that's safe and effective for that. Now, further things that, you know, unfortunately most of us have to take on some level is antibiotics, right? We all had maybe an ear infection when we were a child or strep throat or uh, maybe got a urinary tract infection. A lot of us get into accidents or injury playing sports or maybe a car accident and we have to have surgery. We need to give antibiotics for that. Um, so we're not anti-antibiotics. -anti we're just kind of, you know, we're pro-patient, pro-safety, pro-data. And we're anti, you know, we're kind of like, don't want the side effects. We're trying to minimize it. So unfortunately, a lot of people like, for example, would have allergies. They come to see me, they have allergies. And um, they, they take, you know, they have sinus infections because no one's treating their underlying allergy. So they get sinus infections. And it's like, by the time they come see me, like, you know, already by, the, by July, they'll be like, oh man, I'm on Dr. Pye, I'm on my third or fourth z pack by then. You know, or they're, or they're augmented. These are just antibiotics that are chronically taking. But remember, one pill can cause GI dysfunction up to 18 months later. But I'm giving them a five-day pack of pills. And they're taking it multiple times. So they, guess what? They're actually causing more dysfunction to the microbiome. Everybody's looking at treating the symptom, but not underlying, well, what's causing them to use these? Now, some of them we have to use, like in a surgery. So we have no choice. So we have to use it. The goal is looking at how we can then help with restoring that function. Some of these antibiotics can cause even worse problems, like the, the phloxin drugs, 
completely different lecture, but that's one thing that you definitely want to avoid. Now, those people who have cancer, unfortunately, they have to also take chemotherapies. Um, they also, as I mentioned before, cause dysfunction to the, to the microbiome. But some patients now, and some of these drugs have been kind of uh, repurposed for like autoimmune conditions, right? So like rheumatoid arthritis patients now take methotrexate, which was originally when I was a medical student, only for cancer patients. And now we give it daily for uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients to help suppress their immune system. But we never want to suppress immune system. We want to strengthen the immune system, find out what's triggering the inflammation, find, you know, address those triggers, give natural anti-inflammatories and restore the gut function. So the problem is that even in the rheumatoid arthritis patient, although they might get in the beginning some temporary joint pain benefits, the long-term detriment to their immune system through their GI tract, their nutrition and everything else goes south. And that's why we have to start looking at all these things that people are using and address them correctly. Now, foodborne illness. So foodborne illness is another common aspect. In fact, one out of four Americans will get a foodborne illness every year. Okay. And so what we're looking at is it's common. Like we used to think people getting sick was only like when we traveled outside the country, right? And no, that's eating here. In fact, 40% of those infections are from us eating at a restaurant outside of our home in the United States. 60% is from uh, our aspect of um, eating at home in the United States. Now, these are the, the bacteria that are common, Salmonella, Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter, Clostridium, Cryptosporidium, Shigella. You probably hear a lot of these things in the news a lot of times. And you'll see here where the foodborne illness is coming from. Interesting thing is that 95% of these things are coming from animal proteins, right? Eggs, cheese, meat, 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 pigs, fish, you know, all these things like that. Now you can see there's some from the vegetables and some from fruits and juices, but what that's coming from with the misunderstanding that most people, um, and it's common, believe it or not, I ask my patients all, all the time, they will see on the news, like every season, um, you'll see that, oh, the spinach has E. coli or the, uh, the, the onions have listeria or, you know, the tomatoes have uh, Campylobacter or salmonella. There's a recall of that. But vegetables and plants do not have these bacteria, okay? This is all coming from the inside of an animal gut due to a factory farm that's usually upstream from the farm, okay? So it's contamination. So spinach doesn't have any of these things. Tomatoes don't have these. Now, what's unfortunate is that the water supply from factory farming is being dumped into upstream to the downstream where there might be an organic farm, and then that, that gets contaminated. And then if someone doesn't wash it or cook it very well, then we're getting this cross-contamination. That's why now, unfortunately, which we have to do is with all our fruits and vegetables now, when you get it from the store, even if it's organic, you still have to wash it right? Because it's touched everything. It's fallen on the floor. Many people have touched it, you know, just putting it on the shelf at a grocery store, but you have to be careful. These are all, these are things that are causing foodborne illnesses that causes dysfunction to your microbiome. So interesting thing is that now we look at things like small intestinal bacterial growth, SIBO, a large predominant uh, history with those patients would be having a foodborne illness. So that means one fourth of the, of the people in the United States now have a higher risk of getting small intestinal bacterial growth just from going on a cruise and having, you know, or I just had a, a patient uh, two weeks ago and they were uh, in California, they had a big wedding. And unfortunately, you know, due to the pandemic, all these things, you know, food has not been turning over very well. They went to a nice place, but they had the, the, about 20, 25 people got food poisoning at the, uh, at the, at the uh, wedding. And it's just because food can sit out and can spoil. So you always want to make sure one of the nice things is that as you go to eat, eating more plant-based, okay, not only for your health and for the environment, but you're actually lowering your risk of these kind of, of aspects because you're avoiding the contamination of animal protein products. So just one other thing to look at is like, gosh, if you go more plant-based and you eliminate these things out of your house even, then your risk of getting sick is, is, is lowered much uh, greatly. Now, GMOs and environmental toxins. Okay, so the top 10 genetically modified foods is a list in my book. Uh, now we even have genetically modified salmon that is, was introduced, uh, passed through Congress two years ago uh, into the food supply, which we have no long-term data on that. But these genetically modified foods and you know things that are using this, this glyphosate, as everybody knows, and now it's not just Monsanto, it's a generic now product that, that 
dozens and dozens of manufacturers can use. This also causes dysfunction. Now, there's other 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 scientists and researchers on this panels uh, for this conference who will go into that in detail. So I'm not going to cover that much, but just understanding that these are just similar to triggering dysfunctions of the gut, causing leaky gut. It causes uh, macro micronutrient deficiencies, chelating out certain minerals. So just as much as it kills a weed or it kills an insect, it does on a micro level the same dysfunction to the gut. So you you definitely want to look at eating more organic when possible, avoiding GMO foods, and definitely avoiding um, these kind of chemicals and sprays. I see people all the time just spraying this stuff in their yard, walking around with no shoes or socks and just, you know, without even a mask or gloves, you shouldn't be using it. There's tons of natural things that we help our patients with of like just using like, you know, a high percentage of vinegar products that can actually kill. That's what we use in our office. We use completely... um, safe, natural, like a high concentration of, uh, of uh, essential vinegar. And it kills, we have our groundskeepers and our, and our, and our landscapers for our office and our home actually use it. And they're actually thankful because there's less um, uh, toxicity to them as well. And, you know, this is going to be controversial because I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of questions at the end of the day, but colonics and coffee enemas, you know, this is kind of a, a Western concept that was like uh, developed. And now, you know, you see a lot of alternative, um, uh, alternative, uh, uh, clinics and kind of holistic practices or a hydrotherapist and all looking at, you know, giving coffee enemas or just colonics itself. But one thing that they don't understand is that it actually creates dysfunction of the microbiome. It, it's not normal to be flushing, you know, 10 to 16 gallons of water through your colon. In fact, the water actually uh, becomes a drying agent. Um, no culture does this around the world naturally. You know, natural detoxification is actually having one to three well-formed bowel movements eating greater than 35 grams of fiber a day of a plant-based diet. The reason why this whole thing was invented because when people don't eat a healthy diet, they get constipated and this was kind of the quick fix, but we're not supposed to be going up and like being a car, like and getting a jiffy lube and saying, well, I just need to go get my oil change. We're not like that. We weren't designed for that. And one thing that we've been able to do in the last 10 years is actually measure people's microbiome before and after, and we can show a dysfunction because when we're flushing them out, believe it or not, you cannot replenish. So a lot of people are like, oh, I go to my colon hydrotherapist or I go to this clinic and I was doing a coffee enema, I have cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, oh yeah. And then they gave me this little probiotic. I'm like, that's not going to help you. You've just lost, you know, dozens and dozens and tons and tons of hundreds of billions of species that you only get, you know, again, like maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 species maximum, if you're lucky even to get to your GI tract. Um, so we, uh, you know, from an integrative perspective, we look at always uh, reducing and uh, removing these kind of things. Now, there is no data, by the way, being evidence-based. A lot of people will say, well, I feel better. I have more energy. Well, yeah, because you're constipated. Everybody will. This is more treating the symptoms rather than improving the underlying cause. Because again, we weren't, we weren't designed to actually do uh, evacuation through a machine or, or stimulation. Um, so this is something that, again, is kind of like a trend. That everybody, people have to you know, try to get colonics. But the interesting thing is the more colonics someone does by the drying action of water in the colon, then they actually get more constipated and then they have to come back. And so, in fact, we see all the time, a lot of times, these places will actually give a discount. They'll say, hey, get, you know, get your first two and then, and then for free. Because over a period of time, like you get stuck on these things and then people become colonic junkies. I've had a few patients, in fact, who end up having colon cancer and they're eating a completely, you know, anti-inflammatory plant-based diet. But this is just the chronic irrigation to the colon itself. It becomes a pro-inflammatory idea. Even though they say, well, I see I'm flushing all these toxins out. You're also flushing also good probiotics out. You're also flushing other aspects of the immune system that can't be replenished from some simple pills. So what I want to focus in on right now is the is the diet. Because diet, aside of the antibiotics, some people may never have the antibiotics, lucky for them. Some people may not ever have a cancer, lucky for them, even though one in two men and one in three women will have cancer, which is a problem. Um, and some people like, well, hey, you know, I, I eat pretty good. I'm not constipated. I don't need colonics. I don't have an acid blocker because I don't have heartburn and all. But we have to look at the standard American diet. It's just the largest contributing factor for dysfunction. And it's because... Um, the inflammation that we get. So this is a slide here. Uh, if people can just uh, stop raising their hand until I'm finished, and then that won't interrupt with the slide uh, video that people are going to be watching later at home. I appreciate that. Um, so, so yeah, if, you, if Stephanie, if you can, thank you. Um, so, Yeah, if you can please raise, don't raise your hand till the end of the of the lecture. I appreciate that because I just want to make sure that it, it keeps flashing on my screen, and I just want to make sure that everybody at home um, can see the screen appropriately. So again, I'll answer your questions at the very end. Okay. Um, so animal protein and plant proteins, 
And what I want to, everybody to know is this is the slide. This is the only slide you really need to know. If you want to understand nutrition, if you want to start an optimum health, if you want us to understand what's anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory, uh, uh, just take a look at this. And what you want to do is after this lecture, go back to this, pause it, and actually just look at it, you know, because I might go pretty fast. But this has everything you need to know. And anybody has ever argues, or argues with you or has tried to say, well, no, I need to eat this. I must have this. Just go back to this list, right? Because you're either going to be anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory. You're either going to cause heart disease, right? The number one cause of death is, you know, increased cholesterol and cardiovascular disease risk. Um, that only comes from animal proteins, right? That it causes it. Now, plants don't have cholesterol. So that's why when we go on a plant-based diet, it'll reverse your heart disease risk. Now you will see other providers on, on this conference who will go into detail about cardiovascular disease and all the data and all the studies and hundreds and hundreds of studies that are published in the cardiology, cardiology journals showing that. So I won't get into that. But looking at antioxidants, phytonutrients, fiber, and dysbiosis, that I will talk about today. And then on some of my other lectures, you'll see me talking about other pro-inflammatory, pro-carcinogenic, that means pro-cancer causing agents that come from animal protein and saturated fats, pro-diabetes and blood sugar problems that comes from it, and also the bioaccumulation of environmental toxins, pesticides, herbicides. Remember, just in general, there is no study showing eating animal protein or saturated fat will prevent, treat, or reverse disease. As much as many people will try to argue that, I need it, we need it, it's nutrient dense, et cetera, et cetera. They just don't follow the data, right? They're usually funded by um, lobby groups that are food industries. They're either funded by uh, organizations that have tied to food industries, um, but the data is not there. So you won't eat animal protein to lower your heart disease or lower your cancer risk or lower your blood pressure or lower diabetes. And more importantly, to fix your microbiome, definitely it doesn't do that. And I'll explain why. Plant foods are going to be different. Now, we're going to talk about later in my lecture uh, that you can still have food sensitivities and, and food allergies, and that's important, and that can still come from a plant. So we definitely want to look at all foods in general, but in, when we look at just a broad statement, you want to be moving towards an anti-inflammatory plant diet, most importantly. Now, I won't get into this because this will be in my last couple lectures that you've seen at the conference. My book has all the research and the studies. But when we look at this, because I still will get questions, I'm sure today, of keto and Mediterranean and, and plant-based diets. So when you actually look at the last 130 studies, uh, which we have, and you actually look at the meta-analysis, which other scientists have done as well, um, and they put it to the test. Like, let's not look at a, a small five people, 10 people, a little case report or anything like that. We have to look at short-term weight loss is pretty much what they get, right? But it's not sustainable for long-term and actually does increase inflammation. And, I can talk about that on the question and answer period. Um, and all core morbid factors. So the more keto someone eats in the beginning, yes, they will lose weight. So everybody feels good. The blood sugar will get a little bit better because they're losing weight. They're not eating highly refined carbohydrates. So yes, anybody stops eating, you know, all you can eat breadsticks and donuts will lose weight and feel better. Okay. But then that honeymoon period is a little bit over. And then we start seeing all pro-inflammatory conditions are increasing because they're eating a high still pro-inflammatory diet. And I'll explain that to you. Now, more importantly, just to pay attention, when you start seeing ketogenic patients or practitioners or providers or marketers or social media influencers start telling you, yo, you got to eat keto. That's, that's kind of what our body is supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, they're also selling you greens. Here's a green drink. Here's my red drink. Here's my antioxidants. Here's my fiber supplement. And here's my probiotics. Why are they giving you all this? Because it's not coming from the diet. So that's really a scam, in my opinion. Um, if you eat a, a, a natural plant-based diet, you don't need to be taking as much of these unless you have microbiome dysfunctions or uh, malabsorption issues or lack of getting some of the foods in your diet. We test that, and then we will help our patients, actually, and we can help you, who those people want to come see me. We can help you um, figure out which foods you can eat more of, right? So it's not just supplements. You supplements, supplement the diet, but then replace it. Remember that. And then we want to look at like, what can you eat more of? And then more importantly, what you can't eat more of, then this is something that's going to be potency, purity, safety, efficacy targeted for you to help improve that, that dysfunction or, or uh, deficiency. Now, Mediterranean diet and all the studies did de definitely better than keto, but not better than just plant-based diet. Mediterranean diet is kind of the middle ground that most people, most doctors kind of trend to go to because they still want to have a little bit of salmon. They still want to have a little bit of, you know, a, a little bit of meat. But again, if you want to go to the gold standard now, which is in all the research and uh, all the data, plant-based diets are the best. Now, when we do direct comparison, 
comparative studies. So that's where you have to look at. Let's take patients now and actually put them on this diet, this diet, or this diet directly. So it's not just like I'm reporting on 10 patients, how they did going on a ketogenic diet. Okay. You'll see parameters get better in the first month, definitely up to three months, no problem. But now let's do comparative studies. Like let's put someone on a plant-based diet, on a Mediterranean diet, and put them on a ketogenic diet. And then, you know, calculate correctly what a ketogenic diet is, a Mediterranean diet, and plant-based diet. And you'll see that a plant-based wins on every parameter of losing weight, of losing fat mass. Interesting thing is on ketogenic diets, in the comparative studies, when they actually put them in a trial, they actually lose muscle mass not fat mass. So it's actually kind of counterbalancing what they're trying to do. Um, they, you know, you'll decrease more visceral fat was what we want. We can, you will change your insulin sensitivity, you improve your fatty liver, blood pressure, your cholesterol, and more importantly, lowering the inflammation because it's an anti-inflammatory diet. Now, even more so the plant-based meat substitutes. There's a recent study that came over out um, last year or a year before that during the pandemic because people were moving towards plant-based uh, processed protein foods because there was a shortage on meat due to the pandemic. And so they started looking at, well, what happens when people are eating like a, 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 you know, a plant-based burger or a plant-based chicken or plant-based sausage or a plant-based you know, uh, fish? And they did a comparative study. So they measured the amount of protein and fat of these foods. So like here's a grass-fed, here's wild-caught, and here's free-range chicken and grass-fed beef and, and, and wild-caught fish. And then they had the plant-based substitute and they measured exactly so that the protein and the fat's the same. So we're kind of on even playing field. The protein matching, because everybody's always worried about protein, unfortunately. We don't need to worry about it, but people want our protein to obsess. And more importantly, we're looking at the fat content because that's the mouthfeel, right? Because obviously, you know, we want to have that little juicy burger or that, that kind of like little fatty fish. So when they matched that and they actually ran the study and they had these people eat for, uh, for a month, interesting thing is the plant-based meat substitutes that are processed, believe it or not, that are frozen, that still have other things that we may not think is, as perfect, still did better on all the parameters, meaning they lowered their cholesterol, they lowered their inflammatory markers. Why? Because anti-inflammatory foods, even if it's processed, it still usually has some type of fiber because it's plant-based. It still has antioxidants because it comes from a plant. It still has phytonutrients because it's still from a plant. Now, is this is not as good or perfect as eating a whole foods plant-based diet, but when people are transitioning, and I'm a person that helps people transition, I'm not a purist. There's a lot of doctors and providers who are purists, like you must have this. That's, that's, that's pie in the sky, as I say. Um, you have to meet the patient where they're at. And so we look at transitioning foods. Why? Because if I can transition people that get healthier and healthier and healthier and eventually go to a whole foods plant-based diet, even better. But there's a lot of resistance. Remember, we've been eating a certain way for many, many decades. And that's not only just a physical thing, it's an emotional thing, it's a psychological thing, it's a social uh, aspect. So, so eating clean does not necessarily get you any further. It just makes it more costly. And actually switching over to plant-based substitutes now, evidence-based now, will prove that to be correct correct. Now, pro-inflammatory foods, just real quick, in my book, I go into much, much detail, all these different pathways, but animal proteins is just omega-6s, right? And we always told like, okay, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, omega-6s are pro-inflammatory in general. Now, do you need a little bit of omega-6 in your diet? Absolutely. Do you need too much? No, you don't. Does the average person have way too much omega 6s? Yes. That's why they always kind of push at the health store, uh, even the drug companies were pushing omega-3s. But we have to understand is that, that omega-3 foods create what they call arachidonic acid, right? And this is a pro-inflammatory fatty acid, right? It creates leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and thromboxanes. These are the things that we're trying to block when we take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, like an ibuprofen or a Celebrex or some kind of pain pill, right? We're trying to lower these inflammatory processes. Now, we can do that naturally. My, my uh, lecture on um, Thursday, we'll talk about that. Um, but when we look at this omega-3s here, omega-3s come from flax seed, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, many other ideas as well. But that's where we need to get it from. We need to be eating more of these omega-3s. And nicely, it not only has the protein and the fiber, but it also has the anti-inflammatory omega-3s. Now, it will convert to EPA and DHA. And I'm proud to say that in 2014 or 2013, 2014, I assisted in bringing uh, a company to actually create the first plant-based EPA. They have was a lot of plant-based DHA in the market for many years, but they weren't able to actually extract and we were able to find a source. And now there's what they call plant omega-3s. Now, at the end of the day, if you're eating enough of this, you don't even need to eat the plant oils as well. But these are anti-inflammatory fatty acids. They produce protectants and resolvents. These are things that help lower your uh, cholesterol, they help lower your inflammation, and this helps improve your brain health, your, your cognition and your memory. Now, animal proteins are just high in omega-6s. 
even if you get grass fed, even if you get wild caught, all these you know excuses is still an omega six. Now, is it better than? Is it a little bit lower than omega six from a, a wild caught and a and a free range and a and um, an organic and all this stuff than a conventional? Yes, but it's still pro-inflammatory. So what does it matter, right? These things disrupt the microbiome. And one thing that we want to still look at, and this is controversial because in the data, it was showing that, you know, linoleic acid. So you're talking about like, say, the oils now, right? It's like vegetable oils, fried, fried, fried. It's not good for us. Now, there is a little, now the data will show that there's little conversion of the oils actually into arachidonic acid. That's what the most recent clinical studies have shown. However, it still can be when there's too much. And again, the average American having in certain sectors of America, having lots of fried foods, you know, lunch, breakfast, and dinner, um, and also just excess weight. It's, a, it's a, a, a high fat calorie that most people don't need. Now, I still cook with a little bit of healthy oils. Uh, but I try to minimize the use. I don't try to pour it on everything. You know, oils are not a health food, even though people sometimes think it is. But the idea is that, you know, having no oil in the diet also can be contributing to some other problems as well. So we want to have more omega threes than omega sixes. And the way to do that is by eating a heavily plant based diet. Now, phytonutrients and antioxidants. So, what's a phytonutrient? Phyto meaning plant, nutrient. And antioxidants, which most people, most people know, like vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E. But when you think of phytonutrients and antioxidants, think of the things like lycopene, beta carotene, vitamin C, and all the flavonoids, the folic acid for your immune system, and the indole 3 carbonyls, and the, and the I3Cs, and DIMs, and the sulforaphanes. And now we look at the allyl sulfides, the anthrocyanins, and resveratols, and the EGCGs, and the curcumins. These only come from plants. None of these things come from an animal protein. So you can eat all of this you want. People tell you to eat, 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 wild caught, free ranged, all this other stuff. You're not getting this. And then they're going to sell you a barrage of supplements again, right? You need to be eating these rainbow colored foods, not just sticking to one or two or three, which we all have a tendency to do. You want to be eating a variety of foods that are phytonutrients. They're jam packed with them. Animal protein has no phytonutrients because it's not a plant. So when people eat this, they have to take more supplements at the end of the day. They can't get it from their diet. Now, also, there's very little to no antioxidants. You know, 99% of all animal production of food is factory farm. Only 1% is not. Now I have patients and I have people who are practitioners who are very ketogenic oriented and they'll say, well, Hey, you know, we only get grass fed. We only get wild cotton. All. And I say, well, very lucky for you to be very elitist to the average patient that might be walking in your door because the average person can't afford an extra two or $3 per pound. An average person can't get their fish from a special fishery in Alaska or go to the special farm and pay $20 per pound for bacon, getting it, you know, uh, uh, from a free range or, uh, uh, some kind of, you know, uh, better, uh, source of, a of, a fat, of, a farm. Most people can't. They're going to go to the big box store and just buy some whatever bacon's on, on sale. So there's a little bit of like, I want to get to something that is low cost, right? So it, it's like, I, I'm not looking at access issues. Everybody has access to beans and rice and fruits and vegetables, and it doesn't even have to be organic all the time. So that's another layer of, of, of protection. But the idea is that, you know, trying to get to this plant proteins are jam-packed with phytonutrients and antioxidants. So going back, if someone's telling you you got to eat more of this, then they don't understand the basic concept of nutrition. Now, fiber is a simple thing. Fiber, plants have fiber, animal proteins don't. I mean, I can just drop the mic and leave right now. I mean, that's pretty much a good statement there. Um, what does fiber do? It, remember, it retains water. We have soluble and insoluble fiber. It, pro it pro provides the bulk to the stool to actually create the peristalsis so that you have the evacuation of your bowels, lowers inflammation, blood sugar, cholesterol. Um, and more importantly, fiber, which is only from plants, creates the energy called N-butyrate, which is the kind of CoQ10 of your gut that makes your, your microbiome work. Okay. And it improves the call beta glucuronates. This is how you detoxify. So when I see someone come into my office, standard American diet or paleo or keto, and we measure these things, they're super low in their short chain fatty acids. They're having very, very low to little to no fiber, even if they think that they're eating a lot. Cause they're like, Hey, you know, I'm eating grass and wild caught and I'm eating tons of vegetables, Dr. Pine. And, and I'm eating some, some, some beans and vegetables and some fruits. And guess what? They're not because when you eat the animal protein, you get full very easily. That's why people have a piece of chicken or a piece of fish. Everything else was a side. But guess what? You can't get to that 35 to 40 or more grams of fiber a day if you're eating animal protein. They just can't do it unless they're just really eating lots of food, in which then they usually will have a weight problem as well. 
So we have to look at, you know, the reality is that they're not getting enough fiber. Fiber will improve the bacterial growth of healthy probiotics. This is what diversifies the colors and the fiber. Phytonutrients and, and fiber is what diversifies, which makes your bacteria replicate and produce more. So it's not just, here's more probiotics. Uh, and we can actually show this on testing now. We can show like, but if you make more rainbow colored foods and increase the fiber in your diet, your body will actually develop its abundance naturally. Okay, it also removes dangerous hormones and toxins from the body. So here's your liver, here's your gallbladder, here's the stomach, small intestine, okay? So our gallbladder secretes bile and bile binds to fats and also toxins. And then we have the evacuation. Now, the interesting thing is when we have low fiber in the diet, remember the average person is having seven to 12 grams a day. That's what they have in America. And we're trying to get to 35 grams or more. Um, but when they have this less, this less fiber in the diet, what happens is it's called enterohepatic recirculation, okay? Is what happens is that the foods, the chemicals, the toxins, it doesn't get out, right? It's stuck. That's where they're constipated. So the body reconcentrates all those chemicals and it goes right back through the body again. So for example, with cancer, women who have uh, estrogen positive breast cancer, the lowest re risk recurrence is women who have two to three bowel movements a day. If they have one bowel movement a day, their risk goes up. If they have every other day, it goes up. If they go every two days, it goes up. Why? Because that, the, the stool, the waste that actually has phytoestrogens, xenoestrogens, and the chemical estrogens from animal proteins and the environment and plastics, it is still staying in the body and it's recycling and reconcentrating. So it's hitting them over and over again. Now, another thing is that we interesting, interesting thing to know is that fiber. So when you look at colon cancer, we're talking about colon cancer, colon cancer, remember number two cancer in the United States, both men and women. Now in, in certain parts of rural Africa, there was a great lecture that happened a year ago and I'd like to talk about it just real quick. Um, they were studying the rural, the patients in rural Africa. They're not eating processed foods, okay? So there's it's a place where uh, even I have to eat something from a package, right? So like they're really like, they don't have access. So they're just really, really truly whole foods. And they're not 100% plant-based, believe it or not, right? But they're eating all unprocessed foods. And the interesting thing is their fiber intake is greater than 60, to, and it goes anywhere between 60 and 90 grams, which is almost impossible for us to even uh, to, to complete in a study here. But the interesting thing is their rate of colon cancer is one to 100,000, less than one to 100,000. It's almost virtually non-existent. In fact, uh, the lecturer was saying that they have a higher rate of getting eaten by a lion than getting colon cancer in those areas of Africa. And it's because they're eating this natural diet that is high in fiber, which has always then helped taking out things, okay? In America, again, seven to, seven to 12 grams, the number two cause of death in men and women with cancer is colon cancer. That chronic constipation leads to chronic inflammation, chronic diseases, and cancer. More importantly, even this little organ here, the gallbladder, we used to think that the gallbladder was just secreting bile, bile is the bile salts that bind the fats, right? So people were eating a lot of animal protein, fatty diets, they would get stones, they'd have problems, so they remove it. There's 700,000 Americans every year that get their gallbladder removed today. 700, so almost a million people are getting their gallbladders out every year. Now we understand that this bile that we thought was only absorbing the fats does more than that. In fact, the bile actually recycles four times in our GI tract before it gets excreted. And what it does is it has a sterilization effect to the GI tract, which actually prevents overgrowth. So now that we have a large population, 30%, uh, almost 700,000 people a year removing this, they have a higher risk of getting microbiome dysfunctions like SIBO and gut dysbiosis going forward. Not only just having a fat malabsorption, which affects their vitamin A, D, and E, and K, those are the fat-soluble vitamins, but also other things in terms of the growth potential of bad organisms. And finally, I want to finish with this endotoxins. Endotoxins are from animal proteins, and it triggers inflammatory responses. So if you cook it, well done. If you boil it and you treat it with a pH of stomach acid of one to two, guess what? It still has endotoxins. Endotoxins eventually end up triggering the SIBO, bacterial dysbiosis, candida yeast parasites, increases leaky gut or intestinal permeability. This is what endotoxins do. Endotoxins just create a barrage and cascade of inflammatory triggers, uh, then increasing your risk of obesity, diabetes, and chronic uh, other issues. So again, anybody saying, well, this endotoxin still comes from organic, still comes from grass-fed, still comes from wild-caught. You can't cook it out of it. So again, there's just a little bit of science that people are still like avoiding and saying, well, I'm eating grass-fed or I'm eating clean. Clean is not getting them all the way where they need to go. Now, Stress in the gut. So over the last 10 years, this is kind of the most fascinating area of the gut is that the GI tract now has all these signals 
Now, we've kind of known this in the last 25 years in integrative medicine, but now we have actually the science and neuroscience and the, the, the GI enteric science that, that there's signals going up to this vagus nerve to the brain. Vagus nerve is like the fiber optic cable from your gut to the brain. And the rest of the signals that go from your brain to your gut is just like regular cable lines or phone lines. The fiber optic is so much faster. In fact, the gut and the brain communicate so much so that for every one signal that goes down to the brain, nine signals go up from the stomach and the GI tract to your brain. Okay, now we understand that it's controlling your neurotransmitters. So when we look at uh, anxiety and depression, your serotonin, your GABA, and, and those precursors, and all your adrenal hormones that are affecting your hypothalamic pituitary axis of causing stress and adrenal fatigue, it's all triggered from gut dysfunction. So when the gut is dysfunctional, we also see this gut-brain disconnection and connection. So in short, your gut is affecting your mood and your mood is affecting your gut. And so when we have people that have their gut in check, you know, when people have a, the guts off, then their mood goes off. So more anxiety, more depression, more anxiousness, those other things can occur very easily. And that's why most patients that have IBS who have diarrhea and constipation also have uh, anxiety, depression. Depression comes more with constipation. As the lack of the bowel movement is occurring, there's lower serotonin being produced in the gut. There's more serotonin produced here than here. And when people take antidepressants, they're trying to, you know, trying to regulate the serotonin, but really we have to get the gut moving to help improve the mood. And same thing with anxiety. When the gut's quivering and people are actually having diarrhea, they get more anxiety. That's why IBS patients have both anxiety and diarrhea. But when they treat them with an anti-anxiety pill or an antidepressant, they don't get better. Their symptoms might get better, but physiologically don't get better because it's usually related to gut dysfunction. So definitely understanding that and we help people all the time when they come in to our practice is that they might come in with anxiety and depression, and I can guarantee that they usually will have a gut microbiome dysfunction. And when we help restore that to normalcy, then this area over here gets better. So let's start off with the dysfunctions real quick. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So in the small intestine, remember, we can scope the top, we can scope the colon, but we can't see the small intestine. So there's a breath test. When people have SIBO, small intestinal black, uh, bacterial overgrowth, bloating is the most common symptom. So this is where people feel flat in the stomach in the morning. And then as the day goes on, their stomach gets bigger and bigger. Women will say, gosh, I feel like I'm pregnant by the end of the day. Men, same thing. Like I got to unbuckle my pants or change my clothes. Uh, I just feel bloating. They get nausea. They also get diarrhea, constipation. But this is a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. In the last five years, there's technologies now that are developed. A lot of research coming out of Cedar sinai in the department that actually just studies SIBO. And there's breath tests now that we can do. Uh, for patients at home, uh, that they actually can measure and monitor the certain types of parts per million of hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide gases. And then that tells us what kind of bacteria is producing what type of gas, kind of a fermentation, and then what kind of treatment we can give naturally by, per by prescription can be given uh, to them specifically for that. But people go through their whole life of bloating and bloating and bloating, thinking that it's normal, and it's not. Now, that dysbiosis, that overgrowth, can also then continue on down into the colon. So people can get a bacterial dysbiosis of the, of the colon. So they get more gas, right? They can still have constipation. They still have diarrhea. They still have fatigue. They can still have malabsorption. And it's basically due to an overgrowth of a bacteria. Now, these are not infections from outside. It's not a foodborne illness. It's not someone didn't wash their hands at a restaurant or something like that. It's just a dysfunction of like taking the antibiotics, taking the NSAIDs, taking the stress, taking the animal protein, causing this dysfunction, then these things overgrow. Candida is common. Yeast mycology of different fungus and yeast, you know, are very, very common in the gut and also parasites in the gut. But what we like to do is we like to test for that. We have to like to look like which species of bacteria, which species of mycology yeast or candida or which species of parasites is there. It's not just saying that you have it or it sounds like you do and your people are like, oh, I, have, I think I have candida symptoms, so I give a candida cleanse. Oh, I think I have a parasite, so I do a parasite cleanse. That's foolish. When people start treating themselves with natural antimicrobials or actually prescription drugs, either or, you're causing dysfunction to your microbiome unless it's targeted. Unless you know you have a can. If you can show a culture, then treat. If you can show a parasite, treat. If you can see dysbiosis, treat. If someone's just telling you you have it based off of symptoms and they're treating you, then you're knocking out more good than bad. And again, that's the collateral damage that continues people being chronic with having these symptoms. Now, the gut dysbiosis now then is now related to in the science of thyroid dysfunction. Why? Because 40% of your gut 
is where is reestablishing and re-metabolizing thyroid hormone, free T3, free T4. When TSH is normal, but everybody's still feeling cold and tired, and I need to bump up my, my thyroid medication or my, my armor thyroid or an NP thyroid, or I'm taking thyroid supplements and iodine, we have to first fix the gut. So when all our patients have thyroid problems, we always look at fixing the gut, wait about three months, and then retesting. And we usually see a bump up now that if they're free T3, free T4, TSH gets optimized without even giving them thyroid supplements or medications because we want to optimize where 40% of that function is there. Joint pain, obviously IBS, colitis issues, diabetes, type 2 heart disease. So when there's gut mal dysfunction, people have difficulty with controlling their blood sugars. Same thing with cardiovascular disease. They might be eating a great diet. Guess what? They still have a lipidemia problem. And guess what? More importantly, that we're starting to see in the elderly population is more Parkinson's, Alzheimer's diseases, this gut dysbiosis now in the, in the majority of the population, having 40% in the next couple of years in the next decade, having some kind of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's condition is going to be um, uh, devastating to our country. So this is what we have to start doing is we have to start fixing this gut. The problem is GI doctors are only looking at GI and they're not dealing with ortho. They're not dealing with endocrinology. They're not doing with neurology or cardiology uh, or endocrinology. So what we have to look at is we have to start working integratively and looking at how can we restore all of these functions. Now, finally, some of these patients become chronic. The reason they become chronic is because these bacteria, these are the little villi, those little finger-like projections I showed you. Those little villi, those little villi are then when the bacteria comes in, when the yeast comes in or the parasites come in, you know, it's easy to treat when they're floating outside. So the medication comes, boom, knocks them out, whether it's prescription or natural, it doesn't matter at this point. But over time, if it's chronic and they don't do it correctly, or there's other things like the pro-inflammatory diet they have or the stress they have, or they're undergoing a long treatment, for example, then these, they create what they call a microcolony, where the, these bacteria and fungi and, 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 and dysbiosis kind of collects. And over time, they end up developing what we call a biofilm. A biofilm is kind of like when you're a kid and you're playing hide and seek and you just jump in bed and throw over a blanket and someone come in the room, they didn't see you because they thought the, med, the bed was messy. They didn't know that someone was underneath it. Same thing what happens here is that the body produces like this extracellular matrix kind of protein coat. And then only what's floating around it is treated by the natural or prescription medications. But then over time, this is still causing inflammation to the gut dysfunction. So people feel, I feel a little bit better during treatment. And then they become chronic, like, oh gosh, about four weeks later, six weeks later, all their symptoms come back again. And they're on multiple, multiple rounds. What we end up doing is we give gut disruptors. There are certain natural products now that can actually have been shown to actually dis dis disrupt this, this protein film, releases that, and then we treat, and then they're more successful at not becoming a recurrent patient. And lastly, we want to talk about is leaky gut. What is leaky gut? So these are those little intestinal villi I was talking about before and showed pictures. Here's your little intestinal cells and here's your bloodstream. This is normal digestion. The foods will be blended, comes like a smoothie. You remember it comes down that 35 foot hose. Then, then each of those proteins, carbohydrates based on the size of the molecule uh, uh, and where they need to go in the body, they will get digested through these specific tracts. What happens is when this border is dysfunctional, again, through all the things I mentioned before, then the food proteins can enter in. The parasites or the bacteria, the viruses, everything that's normally protected up here and is not allowed here, and even the foods that are normally up here now can leak into the gut. So when we say leaky gut, is this increased intestinal permeability is that these little spaces on a microcellular level, you can't see this from a general scope. Remember, the scope looks like a big pink too, but when we look at that microscope, you saw those little fingers. Now, if you went in between those little fingers, those spaces open up and those molecules go into the bloodstream, triggering more inflammatory responses. And then we have higher rates of people having not only inflammation, IBS, and other kind of uh, other issues, but systemic inflammatory responses, and more importantly, high rates of food allergies, right? So we always test patients for food sensitivities, and then we can also train the gut to be stronger, fix the gut, and over time, the food allergies will go away. But this becomes a constant barrage where when patients come in and we test them, and they have tons and tons of allergies, then we already know that they usually have a gut dysfunctional problem. So symptoms of microbiome dysfunction, okay, brain fog, migraines, headaches, uh, memory problems, anxiety, depression, insomnia, all the heart, uh, the GI problems, right? Heartburn, stomachache, bloating, gas, diarrhea, IBS, skin rashes, very, very common gut related. My book will talk about that in my story as well. Fatigue, food allergies, chemical sensitivity, any kind of chronic autoimmune inflammatory conditions, higher rates of having dysfunction to the microbiome. Even when they don't really have symptoms of diarrhea or constipation, they actually can still have 
gut issues when we test them. So some people, you know, based on their body type, Ayurvedically, based on their constitution, they might actually not have diarrhea or constipation. Some people don't even have, they don't even notice that they have bloating and you test them and they're way off the charts. Like everything is dysfunctional. There's inflammation, there's overgrowths and, and the, the, that's just, their body's been used to living in that dysfunction. So they're very not symptomatic because that's their norm. Okay. Joint problems, again, heart risk, uh, diabetes risk, and thyroid problems. These are all symptoms of microbiome dysfunction. So if you've gone to a doctor and they said, oh, your thyroid is great, but you have any other of these other symptoms, then definitely you want to have a workup to see what else that can be done to help bring you back into balance. How do we do that? We do that through testing, right? So we look at small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing of the different gases. We're measuring your, your stool, looking at the abundance, the balance, the diversity of their probiotics. You know, do you have the enzymes to break down your foods? Are you eating enough proteins? Are you eating enough fats? Are you getting enough fiber in your diet? Are you creating enough energy from the fiber to feed your microbiome of all your probiotics? Are you detoxifying correctly? Is there inflammation in your gut? Is there any kind of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis? Is there any kind of uh, immune cells that are kind of targeting and fighting something in the gut? And is there any leaky gut? Again, this in increased intestinal permeability. Um, is there any kind of overgrowth? So usually these tests take about three weeks to get back because they grow out in culture in the microbiology lab. They look at, you know, is there bacteria? Is there any kind of candida or yeast or parasites? And they will identify the species. So it's not just here's a panel of five things that the hospital will look at uh, for a, a diarrhea. Here we're looking at, they will look at everything and whatever species. Some people come back with none. Some people come back with two. Some people come back with 12 different species. So every test usually comes back slightly different because it's based on what they find, not just what we're looking for. And more importantly, is that we're looking at then what kind of things to give. What antimicrobials do we give both by prescription and natural, right? So it will then test the sensitivity and resistance. So here are the top five antibiotics, and here's the top five or four natural antimicrobials. And we always want to be using the one that has more bang for the buck, meaning less allergies. And maybe some of the antimicrobials might lower your blood sugar and cholesterol if they have that problem. We want to get something that has multiple side benefits rather than multiple side effects. I just want to end on some a couple of the last couple of slides, but I got this last night, so I threw it in. So hopefully it won't go over time. But Talking about misinformation in, in, in the healthcare, um, a patient sent me this yesterday, so I just made the slide last night. It was in a colon cancer awareness newsletter from a healthcare practitioner group, okay? That's training people all over the country, uh, you know, focusing on ketogenic diets and, you know, kind of, you know, this kind of aspects. And they're calling themselves integrative, which I'm doubting right now. But here's the recipe that we're giving it for colon cancer awareness. So we're talking about Brussels sprouts, quiche. You're talking about, okay, half cup pecans, great. A little bit of sea salt, fine. Two cups of almond flour, excellent. Uh, half cup Parmesan cheese, two ounces of melted butter, one medium egg. That's just in the crust. Then we go three tablespoons of butter, eight ounces of bacon. You know, they have red onion. Ray, yay. We get some fine nutrients here. Uh, Brussels sprouts, yay. That's the Brussels sprouts, the main thing they're trying to sell. Uh, a little bit of yellow bell pepper, great antioxidants, flavonoids, only one, uh, five eggs, a fourth a cup of heavy cream, a little bit more salt, that's okay, um, half a cup of mozzarella, and a little bit of sun-dried tomatoes. So this is the problem here, because this is all pro-inflammatory, right? In fact, you know, this is a creation of colon cancer. So then I start to think to myself, like, you know, we always blame the industry and we always kind of blame like conventional doctors, like, oh, they're just repeat business. But now we're looking at the natural practitioners now. It's like, are they repeating business? Are they opening up hospitals to trying to treat cancer when they're actually encouraging cancer growth? I mean, this is completely contraindicated for the growth or the prevention, uh, more importantly, of, of a tumor. And when we fact look at like animal protein, I didn't cover this, but heterocyclic amines, TMAO, IGF-1, NEU 5GC, these are all things, heme iron. And now, you know, processed meats like bacon has been now declared by World Health Organization as a group one carcinogen, which is the same as asbestos, by the way, right? So how can we be telling someone to be eating this as a healthy part of a diet when it's actually colon cancer awareness? So this is the misinformation every day that patients, and hopefully a lot of you may see like, yeah, I see this before. Or maybe I saw this practitioner. or Maybe I see letters like this all the time. There's this misinformation of like, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory foods. And they'll say, well, hey, you know, if you use this, this, this special farm, it's going to be cleaner. Remember, cleaner is still not good, right? Still causing cancer promoting triggering mechanisms. And my book will cover this. And there's plenty of other videos that I've done in the past. Again, you don't get this from eating real clean food. So don't get 
uh, caught up in these kind of aspects of I'm paying a little bit more per pound to buy my way out of health uh, or buy my way into health. In fact, it's just more just spending more money than, than not. So let's end up talking about solutions before I finish. So those solutions are the following. We want people to eat a whole food plant-based diet as much as possible. If you want to start with transition foods, fine. Start with transition foods and slowly eat more and more and more whole foods, right? So that's okay. Don't have to be a purist on that. You want to lower your BMI. You know, inflammation, I talked about in other lectures, you can see on our website, you can see on uh, YouTube, but inflammation itself with obesity and having uh, a little bit of weight problems, which all of us in America have, okay? So I'm not here to talk about fat shaming. I need to lose a couple of pounds myself over the pandemic. Stress can get to everybody. And so, yes, we definitely want to make sure that we're not becoming in a pro-inflammatory state. So you want to be eating rainbow colored foods, try to get minimum of 30, but try to go higher than that, you know, 30, 35 or more grams of fiber a day. You'll be on your way to improving your microbiome. Now, if someone has a SIBO problem, we definitely have to treat the SIBO first before we eat these foods, because these are the foods that actually kind of make their symptoms worse. However, the key is that these are the foods that actually prevent SIBO from rehappening. So when people put a FODMAPS diet or these kind of trendy diets, right, that's kind of symptomatic treatment, but that's not healing the gut. So we got to overcome these imbalances and then feed the gut what it needs slowly over time to get to that target goal, five grams per, per week, when you, whatever number you're at with fiber, and then get to that. So don't just go from a 12 grams to 30 grams, you won't be happy. You want to do it slowly. Just, so it takes maybe several weeks, several months, uh, depending on where you're at, and boom, your, your gut will be better. I recommend always testing for foods. I've done many, many lectures on this, but both immediate and delayed. Certain foods happen within an hour. Certain foods happen within four days, up to four days. Conventional doctors do IgE. They're looking at for anaphylaxis, naturopaths and chiropractors and other holistic doctors only do delays because they can't order these. We actually need to do both because we need to see is the food coming now and bothering you or coming later? And each food that we're looking at, we want to look at is it an immediate reaction or delayed reaction? This is key because, you know, as people go plant-based and you start hearing a lot of these doctors talk on this conference, eat more plant-based, eat more plant-based. But we have to still look at what are the pro-inflammatory triggers from your immune response that is also coming from a food that's a plant right? Like you can have a problem. Like this person has an immediate and a delayed for bell peppers. They have a super high delayed for eggs. Uh, they have an immediate for chocolate, unfortunately. Uh, and grape raisins is both an immediate delay. So not only having a grape jelly, but having a wine, a glass of wine would be also uh, problematic for them. But there's ways to retrain the body to become tolerant. It's not just avoidance forever. There's ways to fix the gut and become more tolerant to these foods so that you can gain from the plant-based foods, all the nutrition back into the diet. Restoring the microbiome. So we will treat the leaky gut. We'll treat the SIBO if it's positive. We'll treat the inflammation and dysbiosis. We also will look at nutritional testing because, you know, become because of this dysfunction, if there's dysfunction present, then we want to look at like, what is their antioxidants or B vitamins and minerals? How do they detoxify? What's their omega threes, six and nines? We can measure these things, heavy metals and toxins. These are like simple urine tests now that we can do. We don't challenge people. We don't do chelation. That's a whole controversial thing that people are kind of, you know, dog and pony show. We want to look at based on the person's diet and their gut. Cause usually what we'll find is that when we fix the gut, guess what? Their nutrient levels get better, right? Because the food becomes medicine. Now, we sometimes will have to give targeted nutritional supplements when there's deficiencies or we need to get ahead of the pack. Say someone has got a cancer, someone's got a flare. We need to get more anti-inflammatories in. So we'll do that. And don't forget meditation, heart rate variability, heart rate coherence. We teach our patients, we'll teach you if you come do a consultation with us, how to calm that, you know, how to even use biofeedback. Meditation is fantastic, but some people need technology, simple things on that you can get online. There's certain apps that you can use to actually bring your body more into this coherent state put your body and your gut into parasympathetic state, lower your inflammation, increase your natural killer cell function, which is your immune system, improve your anxiety and sleep and relationships. So the mind is super important. So it's not just eating perfect and stressing about it. It's also looking at how do we actually call, remember the gut, the mind, the mind, the gut, they're kind of sending signals to each other. So we want to have the, the mental health is super, super important at keeping balanced. And so finally, treatment options. So uh, again, I'm just going to cover this as a general like category as well. There can be enzymes, there can be prebiotics and probiotics and postbiotics and sporobiotics. There's demulcents that help with kind of creating the lining of the gut if people have gastritis or inflammation. There's also IgG powders that can be given if there's more leaky guts or inflammation that we actually use a, a serum derived non-dairy based for those because we're, we're trying to get more as much plant based. There are certain things that help with detoxification and actually provide the energy if they're not on a plant based diet yet, but we still 
still will encourage encourage them to actually increase their um, fiber intake over time. And then for those chemotherapy patients that are actually getting chemotherapy, there's actually medical foods that actually are over the counter now um, that have been designed by oncology studies to actually help the leaky gut due to chemotherapy. And this is something I just learned a couple of months ago. So it's fantastic. Like they can give a certain amount of amino acids specifically to the patient and it will actually help heal the leaky gut. So it's not just, here's a diarrhea stopper when someone's taking chemo, we actually want to heal the gut. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help people get through a treatment. You know, the things that will help with, with the glutamine and aloe and large help the energy in the cells of the gut and using biofilm disruptors and then a variety of antimicrobials that can be given based on whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a fungi, whether, you know, um, whether whether there's SIBO, whether there's hydrogen or methane, there's different things by prescription, there's different things by natural. In general, though, we want to make sure that you don't treat yourself, right? The key is you need to have guidance. And a lot of people right now are unfortunately going to YouTube, they're going to TikTok, they're, they're watching things like summits, and it's good to get information, but you need to have the guidance. Otherwise, I see patients every day who come to me, they have tons and tons and tons and tons of testing. And the problem is everybody right now is a functional medicine uh, provider. Uh, they're a holistic health coach. And, and the idea is that anybody can order a test. You know, a robot can order a test. Even probably uh, Siri and Alexa in the future will order a test for you. But we need to understand there's a science behind understanding the interpretation of those tests and the systematic um, addressing of which order do you treat this? So if someone has a SIBO and they have leaky gut and they have parasites, or maybe they have food allergies and they have heavy metals or toxins, what do you treat first? Well, there's an experience of what we need to do. A lot of people try to do everything at one time, and that's the wrong way about uh, going out doing it. You know, 22 years of having experience of understanding this is key because that's how we move patients very quickly. A lot of patients will say, I've been trying this. I've seen all these kind of natural practitioners, and they've done all these testing. I'm still having problems because no one's addressing these underlying triggering mechanisms. So um, that is it for today. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'll be glad to answer some questions. Um, I'm also available for any kind of integrative medicine health coaching consultations via Zoom. You can call our office here. Numbers here 505-821-6300. Or you can email us at wellness at And the website's down there as well. For those who haven't read my book, please uh, take a look on Amazon. You can call our office, get a signed copy if you like, or those people who want to listen to something on iTunes or Audible, uh, it's about a 14, 15 hour professional read. So if you'd like to commute or exercise and learn along the way, then please do. Um, but I pr appreciate your patience today. And I look forward to seeing you again uh, Wednesday for our panel and also um, Thursday for my uh, lecture on stacking and inflammation. Thank you. Dr. Pai, thank you so much. This was phenomenal. As always, we really do appreciate it. Um, this is Ben again from The Real Truth About Health. And uh, we are excited to, to take some questions. Okay. Uh, so, so thank you in advance. I know you're cleaning up the screen. Thanks for that. And uh, while you do that, I'm just going to make sure everybody here knows how we go about taking our questions. Um, and that is that we normally don't take questions directly from the chat box, everybody. What we ask you to do is raise your hand virtually. If you're not sure how to do that, what you do is you look at all the different tabs at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you'll see uh, a reactions tab. Your tab is called reactions. You click on that tab and there's a function there that says raise hand. You click on that and we'll see all the questions come in with all the raised hands. We take your questions in the order in which they come in. I see them feverishly adding up already for Dr. Pai and uh, and I will unmute you as we ask you to ask sure. questions. And, uh, well, you're, you're going to stay unmuted, but I'll unmute. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll just answer the questions. You do everything else. That'd be we'll, great. <laughs> we'll set them up and you're not I'm seeing a lot of hands. It's making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you haven't handled for us before. I know. I just, uh, anyway. so let me go ahead and, uh, it looks like the first one I see honor. So I'm going to open up honor and unmute you here. Um, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Question. Sure. About genetics. And yes. gut problems. I have family full of genetic problems, health-wise, with um, a brother who died from cancer after esophageal cancer. It was, uh, after having gut problems, he refused to take any medicine, thought it might cause liver damage. My gastroenterologist said, you better take it. You'll end up dead before liver problems if you don't. Now I'm on three medications for my gut. But Four brothers, all four have acid reflux and gut problems. 
Three sisters, not sure if they have any. I have big time. I've had two surgeries. And my mother, all of us, with acid reflux and beyond. Is that possibly genetic as well as any other things you've discussed? So we do. So we do know that genetics plays a role in about 3% of disease, okay? Uh, I'm not familiar with the genetics of having like GERD run in the family, but what GERD runs into is America, right? That's why we have those proton pump inhibitors and acid blockers that are just literally you go to the store and you'll see like from floor to ceiling and, you know, especially the big box stores. So here's like three month supply box of that and people just, you know, you just order auto ship and it delivers now. Um, the thing is, you know, those drugs used to only be given for a short period of time. In fact, those drugs were only for um, prescriptions, right? There was only like you had to see a doctor and they had to follow it. And then once they lose their patent and they can't charge as much, then they go directly to the market. And now it's like anybody can take it without actually following. Um, does it help in certain indications in the beginning for ulcers and those kind of things? And, and people are having like erosions of the esophagus, severe reflux and damage when they do the scopes. Yes, it can definitely help. But none of those things are still looking at, well, what is causing the triggers of me having heartburn to begin with? There could be some genetics that are playing a role, but genetics are what we have to understand is, is your epigenetics is more important. Epigenetics is your diet, lifestyle, and your environment belief system is what makes your genetics express. So we all are kind of delivered cards, right? And it's how you play the game. I always tell people like that. Um, so it's not just like, oh my God, I'm doomed and gloomed because we know the same thing with heart disease, same thing with diabetes. People say, well, diabetes runs in my family. My great, great grandfather had diabetes. Everybody has diabetes in my family. So they went out and they ate whatever they wanted because they had diabetes or, you know, I have heart disease or, you know, everybody's a heart disease person. So they had a heart attack, but we understand is that there's tendencies that you might put you at higher risk, but it's the epigenetics is how you actually change your RNA and DNA, but in real time, and that's through diet, lifestyle, environment, belief system. So our goal, if we, you know, if we were to work with you and all is be looking at, well, what are the, what are the diet, lifestyle, environmental triggers that are coming in? Just some of that, what's in this lecture, some of that I'll talk about also on Thursday, but what are the triggers that are coming in that are causing this inflammatory response? And it might be the same that's happening throughout the whole family, but your specific individual triggers that will be yours. You might still have the same symptoms as the rest of the family members, but also just as the rest of most of America, not even understanding that, you know, it may not necessarily be as much of a genetic issue. There's some tendencies to be higher, but it doesn't mean that you have to follow that genetic expression the same as your family. Thanks very, very much for that, Dr. Pai. And uh, we're going to bring on Michelle next. Michelle, you are unmuted. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I'm very interested in what you were sharing about uh, biofilm. And I'm curious if biofilm has uh, resulted from, you know, prolonged exposure to these micro unbeneficial microbes. Can, can that be reversed simply through sustaining a very healthy whole food plant based diet? Um, and, you know, staging those foods back into the diet without having to do any type of a candida protocol or an, anything like that. Can, can you make the gut healthy enough through diet and lifestyle without doing those harsher intervention with herbs? Well, that, that's actually a great question. Um, and we see that partially. Uh, and the reason being is because some things have been super chronic, right? So if something's just relatively new, Someone's like, yeah, just the last couple months, then the diet can relatively fix that, you know, but if something's like it's been happening, you know, for a decade or more, then we know that there's going to be a, a harder challenge. Now, does their symptoms improve just with diet alone? Yes. Usually, you know, when people go to a plant-based diet, the data will say when our clinical experience actually matches the data, about 80, 85% of most conditions just get better. Right. But when we have this biofilm issue is that if it's a chronicity of issues, then we have to look at, can we give something to help disrupt that? Otherwise, they're like, I've treated, I treated, or I'm eating a spectacular diet. I mean, you can't ask some of these people to do more than what they're doing. I mean, they actually go further and beyond what I would expect them because like, wow, they're really hardcore. They're really you know, crushing it, being trying to, you know, be perfect and not have any kind of extraneous aspects. The problem is still, though, is that if there is biofilms, it is a little bit more difficult. And so I always like to look at when we get people to like uh, either take a natural therapy or, you know, we're changing, we have to get about 80% to that. This week. We call it the 80% threshold. A lot of the doctors in GI uh, who treat SIBO and all, we talk about this 80% threshold. If you get to 80% improvement of your symptoms, the diet will take over. It doesn't have to be 100%. And in fact, it's, it's foolish for people to think like, I'm going to take a treatment, it's going to be 100%. Nothing's 100%, prescription or natural. Not, nothing's 100%. But what you want to do is you want to get to that point where like, you know, when, you're, when people are about 50%, it's still like a teeter-totter. It can swing the other way. Now, some people like, can get 50% and their diet is great and then boom, you know. But if their diet has been great for a long period of time and 
and they're still having symptoms, then it looks like we still have to call that there might be some chronicity of the biofilm being there and, the, and, and disrupting it. Otherwise, it's like they're not they're not getting that full benefit. And it's no fault of their own. It's like it's like you can't eat better food or 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 or, 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 or more anti-inflammatory food if you're already doing it. The idea is that that's just more of a physiological thing that's becoming a chronic problem. Thanks very, very much for that, Dr. Pai. And uh, now we're going to move to Curtis. I'm going to unmute you. Welcome, Curtis. Hi, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Very good. Uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm uh, from uh, talking from just outside of Minneapolis. Um, so I've dealt with uh, chronic fatigue. My daughter has Hashimoto's. So we've been down the whole um, functional medicine tour. Um, it was helpful somewhat. Um, I'm very interested moving forward how we can um, improve physician training, education in training. Because um, it sounds, you know, because you were you just had mentioned, you know, you know, the, the MDs have access to certain kinds of tests that these, you know, that a, a straight Cairo or some other kind of or a health coach functional person wouldn't have access to. And so what would you consider to be um, like, you know, an ideal blend of, um, of, of education and training to, for physicians who are going to be dealing with, with PANS, you know, kids sure. and sure. all of these, um, in all of these kinds of gut, you know, of these lifestyle related environmental, you know, cause, cause we live in a, in the United yeah, States. You're absolutely correct. I hate to interrupt, but yeah, we live in this world where it's not, you know, it's not just the diet, although it's a huge contributing factor, but now we have environmental exposures, right? That, that we didn't sign up for. We have exposure where you live, depends on where you work, depends on you know, your house, depends on the water you drink. You know, I'll talk some of that on Thursday's lecture as well. But the, the issue is what, what I have, and this is my personal kind of vice, I think, is that too many people have access to just get labs. And, and, and the problem is right now, because lab companies don't care, right? Lab companies would make money on the labs. Like in our practice, we don't upcharge on any of the labs. And right now in functional medicine and some of this kind of holistic uh, expansion of this, and everybody's trying to be like some kind of functional medicine practitioner. When I did my training, it was 20, 22 years ago with functional medicine. I was like, before they even had, like that was like one of the first people in institute functional medicine. Now they're like, there's so many different certificates and grades of certificates and what kind of degree you might have. So everybody thinks I'm a functional medicine practitioner, not even being a healthcare provider, they can still get a functional medicine practitioner. The problem with that in my opinion, is, is that they don't have the background physiology, anatomy, immunology, pharmacology, uh, and nutrition. Now, a lot of doctors, rightfully so, unfortunately, they don't have the nutrition part of it as well. And it takes, it takes a, a unique type of person to say, okay, I need to start filling in all these gaps. The problem is, I think they're addressing, you know, a lot of people are just ordering tests because that's a revenue producing thing in their practice. Like, hey, you can do all these tests. And I have all these patients again, they said, I spent $10,000 on all those tests, but no one tells, and literally I get like four patients a week. They're like, here's a stack of things, but no one can then tell me what this means. I'm like, well, then they shouldn't be ordering the test. The problem is now that all these lab companies don't care who's ordering the test, as long as they have some kind of certificate, then it causes patients really a lot of stress because, you know, there's a cost to those tests, unfortunately. It's usually not covered by insurance uh, and, or they have some kind of out-of-pocket pay. But the thing is, it's very, it, it's very important information to actually help use. Like, I don't want to throw away information that someone has. Like, you just have to understand how to interpret it. But there is a lack. Now, also on the flip side, uh, a lot of the MDs who may have access don't have the training of that, right? Because they're just conventional. So like the GI doctors who should know the most about this, there's a few. Uh, not in this country, there's a few in other countries I've seen before, who are fantastic. They're like, wow, they're so ahead of their field. And it's just because we're kind of still practicing, you know, a lot of doctors are practicing on symptomatic treatment rather than kind of going to the disease prevention and intervention and of looking at what are the triggers and kind of going at the root cause of disease and more importantly, the, the dis-ease that people have. And so it's a tough thing. I think what we have to do is we have to have this idea of like, understanding what a true integrative medicine physician is. A lot of people now throw this word around. You know, I, I'm fellowship. I was in one of the first classes 22 years ago, right? So that was before they even understood what the word was. And people are like, oh, what are you doing? And now everybody's trying to grab holistic and integrative and, you know, lifestyle. Everybody's trying to grab some kind of certificate now of training, but they're not actually going through a full fellowship. They're just like, oh, I just went to a weekend course and I got this so-called certificate. Or a lot of people now just use it on the internet, uh, on social media, and they're not even even did a class or, or even fully trained. So it is a problem. I think it's going to take several years because I think there's a lot of collateral damage where patients are now kind of going from right to left. Like they go to conservative doc, they don't know what they're talking about, uh, meaning they don't address these things. They, they're good at what they look at, but they're not looking at it from a functional or integrated perspective. And then they go to the naturopath or chiropractors or some of these other docs 
or practitioners uh, with some kind of certificate. And then they're not getting also the integration of like, well, how does this medication or how like the lady, like, how does this genetics work? Or how does this other part of my disease affect this? And they're like, I can't tell you that because I'm not trained in that. Or they will try to tell you that and that's wrong because they don't have the training to do so. So uh, I don't really have a good answer for you, but I hopefully over time, there will be more people like me and more kind of training programs that will be looking at. I just look at really look at the quality of the training of the provider. You know, it, it, I'm kind of old school. It's letting you know, like everybody I look at who's like 20 years younger than you have a fancy website. They have great social media presence, but their educational experience is pretty much nil or lacking. And you probably experienced that. It sounds good. You like this, this is what I, they're speaking my language. I, they, they're, they're onto the pans or they're onto the environmental toxicity or, or they're onto the, you know, the, the autoimmune condition. But when it actually comes to like, what do we offer you? And then what are the, what are the things they don't have the evidence-based understanding of the experience of practicing medicine. And that's the challenge. Right. Uh, and so we, we, we will hopefully over time we can expand that um, and have better trained physicians and practitioners and actually have a, you know, I, I work with, the, you know, even though I do a lot of things myself, I, like when I, when there's something that's out of my lane, then I'm like, you need to go see this person for that. You need, I mean, like the, the, the best kind of practitioner is knowing, you know, where, where you stand. And so I know exactly what I'm really good at and I will pride myself on being the best at and things that I'm slightly off. I'm like, well, that's not my area of expertise. Then I'll say like, well, maybe there's someone else. And then hopefully I can help also get, if they say, well, what about this practitioner? Then I can kind of sort of look at them and kind of vet them on some level saying, yeah, they probably will be helpful or, you know, stay far away from them. They're just going to steer you wrong. Um, thanks for that perspective. And, and of course, for your candor, Dr. Pai. Um, up next, we're going to bring up Stephanie. Stephanie, you are unmuted. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your work. And I love your background. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Food is medicine. That's what I'm trying to do. Yes. Um, I have a son um, and he has asthma, allergies, eczema, and the like. And the most recent um, that came up was seizure brainwaves. Mm -hmm. And I was told, and I also read that the keto diet is very promising for that. But now you seem to be not on board with keto as much. So I was just curious your thoughts on keto being recommended for seizures. Yeah. So there was some early data a long time ago that when, when they're treating patients with seizures, they would put them on a high, like more of a ketogenic diet to help lower this inflammatory response, right? Yeah. But from our perspective, that puts the patient, especially the child, uh, in a pro-inflammatory response over time. When it came to studies, like I, I was in a big study in 2008, at, and there was a conference at Hopkins. And they were looking at, and I'm not going to talk about seizures right now, but I'll give yeah. you the idea. Um, cancer, because that's a big thing when we talk about ketogenics. So they were looking at breast, colon, prostate uh, uh, brain tumors. And when patients were eating a ketogenic diet on the first month, there was an improvement of their tumor response. So a little bit of tumor regression, meaning shrinking. Why? Because they weren't eating the highly refined sugar products, uh, highly glycemic products, you know, so white sugars, white bread, blah, blah, blah. So less obviously growth of cancer because tumors have, you know, 10 to 12 times more insulin receptors. So it'd grow faster. So yes, you would see this. So the industry from that lecture, that, that day, one day the seminar went crazy. They took this and they wrote it. The food industry like keto, 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 keto. Everything was great, great, great. Month two, you start to see a stabilization no, no change in the tumor. And then month three, we start seeing this increase of not only the tumor, but we start seeing an increase in all other comorbid conditions, meaning arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. It's just pro-inflammatory diet. They're not getting what they need, the phytonutrients, antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the thing is, there's a little bit of a you know, benefit in the beginning, but from us, I'm like, why am I restricting? Nobody's eating a ketogenic diet naturally. If you look at the blue zones, people who live past a hundred centurions in cities of groups of people, like in communities, right? There's five different people, five different places around the world, different genetics, so different types of diet. But what are they eating predominantly plant foods. Legumes is actually the biggest of, the, of all the foods, beans and legumes, which some doctors are saying, don't eat lentils, don't eat beans. I'm like, but these are the things that the people eat the, that live the longest. We got to avoid trying to biohack the body. I always talk about this. Biohacking does not help us. That's a trend that's really popular on social media. It's a trend that's in all these conferences, biohackers, the fathers of biohacking. And but I, I see this all the time. Anytime you start cheating science and nature, nature doesn't help you. Nature will come back and slap you inside the, the head. You have to uh, understand the laws of nature and then nature will reward you in kind. That's where like we have to understand. So, but everybody was, doesn't want to eat as healthier or they don't want, they want a quick fix or they want to kind of do what they always wanted to do. So it kind of feeds into their own perception and belief. Trust me, I was needing the perfect diet before I went plant-based. I was just the standard. Of, I know I was more of a uh, I'm eating clean more than anybody. I used to get my beef and my this, my fish from here. My, I mean, I was that person. 
right? But I can tell you my numbers aren't as good as they are today. I don't feel as, as good a, as I do as today. I feel fantastic versus what I did even when I thought I was eating clean, right? Because that's just our, our self-perception of saying, well, I'm eating something. So when it goes back to seizures, believe it or not, we want to look at what are the triggers. We always want to look at the gut microbiome key. We want to look at you know food and inflammatory triggers. Most kids that do have seizures have a dysfunction of both. Anybody who has skin or eczema problems definitely have food sensitivities, but it's also related to gut dysfunction. So we always look at those. If you read my book or you hear my, my story, It'll be the same thing, right? There's even other things that you can give natural that, you know, um, that the CB1, CB2 receptors are not only in the gut, but also in the brain. And those are things that also can help lower uh, the effects of seizures. So when we use like endocannabinoids coming from predominantly hemp, we don't need to have any kind of THC in this case. Um, then there are certain things that actually that naturally will fix the gut and also now been using for seizures uh, in patients, even in Europe is what they give as a prescription. So there's a lot of natural things that we have to look at what's the triggers rather than looking at, well, what's, how am I going to restrict this person for their diet so much? What we have to do is like, is it nutritionally sound? Are they getting the phytonutrients? Are they getting the antioxidants? Are they eating an anti-inflammatory diet? If not, then that biohacking will have a detriment over the long haul. In the beginning, it might have a short-term benefit. There's always this honeymoon period, but then the marriage may not be good going forward. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Thank you so much. And um, we're actually up against the clock. It's, it's time to bring out our next lecture. So I just want to apologize to everybody. We couldn't get to you're so popular. We had more questions than we had time for. And we appreciate that. Everybody will try to get them all in at our next turn. Um, Dr. Pai, thank you so, so much again for coming back this year. Thank you for today. We're looking thank you very much. And I'll, I'll see you guys on the Wednesday night and also on the Thursday on my individual other lecture on the stacking of inflammation, how to avoid it as well. We're so glad that, that you're coming back this week. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not, I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So we're going to unmute everybody. Oh, wonderful. I love it. Dr. Pai. Thank you. 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 Thank you.